Uh, welcome to another briefing from Arab Center, Washington, D.C. My name is Ahmad Harb. I am the Director of Research and Analysis at the Center. Today's briefing is titled The Bitter Harvest of Lebanon Sectarian Politics, in which we try to shed some light on the ongoing problems of the country and its people. In a nutshell, Lebanon today is suffering from the collapse of an old sectarian compromise that previously worked to secure some rickety accommodation between the different sectarian politicians. Its president, Michel Aoun, has, been, has failed to act like an arbiter in the political system as uh, like, like other uh, previous presidents uh, had done before him. Uh, country, the country is led by a caretaker government uh, headed by Hassan Diab, while a new government has not been able to be formed since last October, since Saad al-Hariri was uh, given the mantle to form the new government. There is a general popular disgust, if I may uh, add, uh, with the political class and the general atmosphere in the country. Popular protests that erupted in October of 2019 have all but, but disappeared, and uh, sectarian discourse is on the rise. And uh, uh, today, uh, Tripoli, uh, the northern city of Tripoli, is uh, at it again with uh, a lot of protests, especially because of the coronavirus lockdowns. The country's economy is in free fall as the value of the local currency collapses opposite to the dollar and inflation has soared. Gross domestic product is predicted to decrease by about 20% from 2020, and 2020 had decreased, the GDP in 2020 had decreased by 9% from 2019. International lending institutions have stopped lending the country, and uh, both friends and foes uh, have uh, basically uh, given up on lending any money to the country. Uh, uh, poverty levels have reached 50%, maybe higher while unemployment has soared. Socially, Lebanese society is suffering from the debilitating impact of paralyzed politics and the collapsed economy. Poverty, unemployment, creeping homelessness, collapse of networks, social networks, and the role of the state, all combined with the impact of the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, to plainly shut down social activity and possibly social activism. This situation begs many questions, such as what is wrong with Lebanon's politics and whether there are any uh, uh, chances for a breakthrough and anytime soon, how political paralysis affects the country's economy and development, what conditions of governance have led to the current collapse of the economy, how do the Lebanese people experience the political and economic troubles of the country, what degrees of mobilization and activism are there, and uh, what is necessary to, to do that, to deal with the uh, coming slide into the abyss. These and other questions will be tackled by a group of specialists uh, who join us today, both from Lebanon and from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, and they have witnessed the country uh, and its chaos and its stability. Uh, each will have about 15 to 20 minutes to present their, their uh, presentations, uh, and uh, it will be given, uh, their presentations will be given in, the, in this order. Rami Khouri is the Director of Global Engagement at the American University of Beirut, and he will discuss the major political issues at play in the country and how the country has lost its special status in the Arab region. Uh, he is followed. He will be followed by Ali Mbayid, who is a, an economist and specialist in the MENA region. She will discuss how policy inaction and state capture have aggravated the socio-economic conditions in the country and affected the international response, and what the possible implications may be of the continued political stalemate. Then we will have Mona, Mona Harb, who is a professor of urban studies and politics at the American University of Beirut and a non-resident uh, fellow at Arab Center, Washington, DC. She will be covering such issues as inequalities and vulnerabilities in Lebanon, the absence of a national social policy, and how all this is instrumentalized by sectarian political actors. And now I turn the floor over to uh, Rami. Rami, the floor is yours. Thank you, Imad, and thank you to the Arab Center for organizing this and for Nadine who's behind the scenes work. And I'm delighted to be with uh, Alia and uh, Mona, two uh, scholars and professionals whom I respect very much. 
And uh, I think the three of us together will provide different angles that will help um, clarify perhaps what are the trends uh, in Lebanon. Um, my in interest is mainly in the relationship between what's going on in Lebanon and what's going on in the wider Arab region. Um, I've been, um, I've lived in Lebanon three times in my life. Um, and uh, most recently, just until a few months ago. Uh, and it's fascinating that every time I, I lived there in the late 50s, um, in the 70s, uh, mid, mid, late 70s, and, and, uh, and the last 15 years, uh, there were episodes where American warships were camped uh, in the waters nearby and making gestures about uh, either get, getting involved in the conflict in the region in Lebanon or threatening to do so or sanctioning or doing something else. So it's, it's not an accident that you have this history of trends inside Lebanon that are intimately linked to regional trends and global trends. The situation uh, in the in most recent period, in the last uh, year and a few months since the uprising started, um, has been very dramatic. But I think to fully understand it, we need to put it in two contexts. One is the historical one uh, for Lebanon, and one is the regional one um, for what's going on across the Arab region. And historically, I would say it's the uprising that started in October last year until now, and it's still going on, uh, as we can see in outbursts in, in Tripoli right now this week and other places, the corona and the economic collapse have sent people home mostly, but the, the drivers of the uprising are still very strong inside people's uh, hearts and minds and pocketbooks, and they're just not sure what to do about it. But um, right now, there seems to be a low point in public demonstrations, but that will change. Uh, over time, but so this period from October last year to now uh, is um, uh, October 19 to now uh, is one time frame. The second one is from 2005 until now, which when the Syrians left Lebanon or left at least their physical control of the country um, and a, a new variation of the Lebanese sectarian power sharing uh, happened um, and uh, we've seen the, the the continuous deterioration uh, over the last uh, 20, uh, 20, 15, 20 years since 2005. The third time frame is uh, really from the mid-70s, late-70s until now. In other words, the last 50 years or so. Um, and that's the period when the, the gush of oil money in the Arab world, combined with the autocratic regimes mostly military coups that took power in Iraq and Syria and Libya and Yemen and um, uh, Sudan, all over the region, when the combination of autocratic indigenous uh, lead, leadership with plenty of oil money created a new ruling uh, power structure that dominated the region. And uh, we can trace some of that back in Lebanon as well from the uh, early 80s until Today, of course, Lebanon also had its uh, civil war, but that combination of local and regional aut autocracy, militarism, and money uh, was one reason. But the last fourth, um, and to me, the most fascinating co context is really from 1920, a uh, hundred years ago, the century of modern Arab uh, statehood, uh, in which for the first 50 years or so, many Arab countries, including Lebanon, after it was created as an independent sovereign state, um, people's lives improved, broadly speaking, across much of the country. So there was steady improvement and a middle class emerged, a national identity started to emerge. And you see this all over the region in Kuwait and Jordan and, and, and Libya, and where you know, I see it in many countries, Syria. Um, and because people's lives were improving, you didn't really have mass uprisings against internal autocrats. And most it only happened once or twice in Sudan and uh, Iraq, but for, for different reasons. Um, but the, um, the reality is that after the first 50 years of statehood, um, starting in the mid 70s, early 80s, the last 50 years of statehood have been a stagnation or a downhill continuous trend, leaving us now in a situation which 
in Lebanon, for the first time, I think, ever in its modern history, uh, Lebanon is no longer a distinctive political system. It was always somehow different from the rest of the Arab world, partly because of its uh, serious uh, pluralism, uh, religious and, and cultural and political, partly because it was always more open, there was more freedom. You had, and that's why you had for many, many years, um, the great universities of Lebanon flourished, the media, publishing, theater, the arts, any activity that required using your full human brain or your full cultural and artistic and creative instincts flourished in Lebanon because people had that space to do so. And that's, and as the rest of the region became mostly autocratic, uh, people fled to Lebanon. And, and so we, we had this distinctive uh, Lebanese system that was always seen as different from the rest of the Arab world. Well, that's finished now because what the last few years have shown us, the last, I would say, 15 years, since 2005, uh, is that Lebanon has now become a full-fledged Arab country in the sense that its population is pauperized and helpless, politically helpless, uh, pauperized economically, and, and the, the tragedy of the pauperization and the growth of poverty and inequality is that nobody can give you a precise figure because the government doesn't have the mechanisms, credible mechanisms, to measure uh, poverty and inequality and marginalization. There's many, many estimates, um, and the ones I like to use are the ones from the UN, from ESQA, done by local researchers, which are showing us that, uh, um, which is showing us that the, uh, um, the trend uh, in Lebanon is getting worse in terms of poverty and uh, inequality. Um, and the um, uh, reality is that the corona, the um, uprisings, uh, the regional economic downturn, the drop in oil prices, all of these things, which Ali will talk about more, uh, created a huge hit uh, to the uh, economic situation. Um, and now we have the situation where somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of the Lebanese population are in poverty or right uh, in the vulnerable edge uh, of, of poverty. The other thing where Lebanon has become similar to other Arab countries is as these citizens challenge their state and demand their rights and a decent dignified life, uh, the state responds with a militarized uh, uh, response. And we saw it in Tripoli a few days ago and it's still going on and off. Um, so the, the situation in Lebanon now is one uh, in which the country has joined the rest of the region, um, but without really being able to come up with a new uh, uh, configuration that makes statehood, citizenship, and sovereignty actually work well. Um, the, uh, the pattern that we see in Lebanon is repeated all over the region, and in the countries where there are on continuing uprisings, Iraq, Sudan, Algeria, and Lebanon, uh, we have uh, uh, almost identical demands by the protest movements. Some of the protesters are more organized than others, but their demands are all the same, uh, which is showing us that this is a regional problem. Um, and it comes out of the same uh, reality, which is that a political elite that was not elected and is not accountable in any meaningful way uh, has treated its people with disdain and has shown the citizens that it doesn't really care about their well-being. So what, what happened was if in the last, I would say, eight or 10 years, uh, the power structure has essentially, the state has essentially told its citizens, we don't care about you and has detached itself from its citizens. And what's happened in the last year and a half is that the citizens in return have now said to the state, well, we don't want you. We want all of you to leave. Uh, and this is quite an extraordinary situation uh, where the state and the citizenry don't want each other, but they don't know how to uh, come up with a better uh, situation. And therefore, we're likely to see a continuation of economic stagnation, political pressure, and, uh, and, other, uh, and other problems. Um, the, um, 
the important thing I think to keep in mind also is the role of international intervention and regional intervention. Um, the uh, presence of international actors has been in the country since the mid 19th century. Uh, it's nothing new and it continues to uh, take place and, and maybe is expanding now with uh, signs of Turkish uh, engagement in parts of Lebanon. Iran, of course, is in Lebanon in a big way through Hezbollah and other groups. The Saudis have long tried to be involved through the Sunnis um, and and Assyrians, of course, were in and out and they're still involved behind the scenes. So you have this incredible uh, legacy of regional and international direct intervention, including military intervention, and not to mention, of course, the Israelis who've constantly been using Lebanon for their own uh, purposes uh, and have you know, attacked it and uh, occupied it, etc. So this continuing trend of international direct military and political intervention, uh, whether through sanctions or occupation or threats or whatever it may be, uh, is one that continues and is also a hallmark of the region. Uh, the Syrian war uh, made this very clear that it, it was acceptable for regional powers like say the Saudis, the Emiratis, uh, the Iranians, uh, the Turks, a regional power can combine with a local power, the local power could be an NGO or a militia or a political movement, um, and combine with a superpower. So in Syria, you had the, um, uh, the, the, the Russians, uh, the Iranians, uh, Hezbollah, uh, local groups were all uh, fighting at the Turks, they were all involved fighting each other in Syria. And that has now become a, a common regional uh, kind of hallmark, um, a mechanism whereby people get involved in Yemen and Libya, uh, possibly again in Somalia and places, uh, and in Lebanon, and who knows where else this is going to happen. So this, uh, this regional uh, intervention, military and political intervention, um, is also a new uh, uh, element at the large scale that it's happening. There was always foreign intervention in Lebanon, but it was usually somebody paying off a newspaper to speak for it, somebody helping a political group. Uh, now it's much more uh, in, uh, at the level of big movements. And of course, the result of this now is that, the, in my view, there are only two political actors in Lebanon today. Um, the first, of course, is Hezbollah, which is a gigantic force in the country, uh, not always openly discussed, but it's there. People understand its power. The other force is the people protesting, the protesting citizens, who have not figured out yet how to bring about the changes they want, but they're going to they're gonna keep exploring ways to do it, including getting involved in elections next year and other uh, possibilities. Uh, but the, the stalemate that exists now with the political order that is uh, pretty clear in its inability and unwillingness uh, to fix the problems of the country or to make any serious reforms, even when you have people like the French president coming in, the World Bank, IMF, people saying, we've got $10 billion to help you. Uh, even with that, the political order is, doesn't, uh, isn't going to make any changes. Um, and the citizens are not going to stop protesting. They can't all uh, immigrate. They can't all rely on savings. So there's a terrible stalemate, uh, which is going to have to be resolved somehow in the coming year or two, but nobody knows how. The, the fascinating thing to me is how closely the conditions in Lebanon, the attitudes of both the power elite and the citizenry reflect what's going on across the whole region. Um, the latest uh, Arab opinion index put out by the Arab Center in, in Doha and Washington uh, show, shows us trends around the region, uh, which are almost exactly mirrored uh, in public opinion trends in Lebanon, which is um, about 70% of household income is not sufficient to cover basic needs. Um, about 20 to 25 percent of people want to immigrate. Uh, 30 percent uh, of people 
in the 18 to 34 year old group one immigrate, which is the most dynamic group uh, in society. 90% uh, and over see corruption as a main problem uh, in their country. Uh, 60 to 80% see the uprisings as something that's good and they support it. So these trends are regional trends and they're exactly mirrored uh, in Lebanon now. And that to me is, is quite uh, striking. Uh, how the political protesters react to the stalemate that they're in now uh, remains to be seen. There's many discussions going on, which, uh, which uh, Alia and Muna uh, will, will know a lot about. They're there and they can uh, perhaps clarify this. Nobody knows how this is going to be uh, resolved. And um, uh, with, with that, I will stop my comments and turn it over to the next speaker, hoping that we can get some clarity on these issues. Uh, thank you, Rami, very much. Uh, we appreciate it. This is a really all-encompassing uh, and, and uh, wide-angle uh, look at uh, Lebanese uh, political and regional problems. Uh, today, uh, now, uh, Alia, uh, please tell us about uh, how the economic situation is going. Um, uh, thank you, Imad, and thank you for the Arab, Was uh, Arab uh, um, Center, Washington DC, for uh, for inviting me again. And 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 I would like to to maybe build a little bit on what um, uh, Rami has said, uh, not necessarily to go to go again and explain how historically this uh, uh, interplay between. Uh, um, uh, uh, fractious uh, uh, politics uh, uh, based on sectarianism and the um, uh, widespread uh, uh, clientelism uh, that uh, uh, that weakens state institutions and that uh, uh, married with uh, some sort of uh, crony capitalism led to a an extremely weakening state institutions. Uh, and 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 this, uh, this interplay between these factors have are in my view even as an economist um, are, are are at the core center of of uh, the current crisis uh, that uh, uh, and I would say multifaceted crisis that Lebanon um, is is grappling with. Um, I will not try to explain that in details. I think even when um, uh, I was with you um, in August, we spoke about this at length. But I would like to focus on three three key issues uh, uh, today. The first one is, is really reflect on how the interplay of these factors since last year um, uh, have contributed to both uh, the um, aggravation uh, uh, of the economic, financial, and social uh, uh, social crisis, threatening basically increasingly the national security um, of Lebanon. Uh, then I would like to maybe speak very briefly about uh, the deterioration of these economic indicator and some of the trends, both positives and negatives, that uh, we are seeing emerge as a result of this morphing uh, economic crisis. And then maybe uh, try to throw uh, some ideas on, on how should we think about the outlook for the economy, uh, given both this uh, domestic uh, sociopolitical landscape, but also the changing uh, regional, uh, both geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, setup. So on the first point, I think um, uh, my view, and I have been uh, here in Lebanon uh, for uh, at least, uh, I could say very easily over the last year, closely associated with the uh, development of the financial crisis. I, uh, I, I, I can confirm uh, that uh, the combination of um, uh, first uh, incompetence and policy inaction uh, by those in charge of economic uh, policies on the one hand, but also uh, the um, um, uh, coming to fore of, of how strong state capture uh, is, uh, is in Lebanon by, uh, by uh, warlords and their associated uh, basically business elites um, uh, have played a, an increasing, a, a fundamental uh, role in not only in um, uh, preventing any solution for the crisis, but actually um, aggravating its fallout, particularly on the middle class um, and, uh, and the society uh, uh, at large. How is this? Very quickly, I think we all remember uh, uh, when, when, uh, when the crisis started unfolding, uh, at the end of 2019, and by no means this is a crisis that was uh, uh, that doesn't date to many years before. We've been talking about it very clearly. 
uh, very, very um, uh, um, at length for four years. Uh, but as it erupted, um, I think, uh, and, and the new uh, uh, government came into place, we have clearly seen first the past government uh, inability uh, to deal with the uh, um, unraveling of the crisis, but also the new government that came into place was at a loss on how to deal uh, 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 with it. Not only were they not aware of the size of the crisis, its implication, and how to go about it, but I think more importantly, as we went into um, uh, uh, the policy uh, decisions that, that the Diab government has taken, we have seen the rise of um, uh, um, uh, increasing role of political elites in um, as the uh, as people as they started understanding the implication of uh, the uh, collapse of the banking sector and the uh, 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 the default on the debt and its implication on um, uh, on the losses both in in the banking sector but also on the uh, sovereign balance sheet of the state and how. Uh, the distribution of the losses uh, will invariably change the uh, uh, economic power balance within uh, within the system. Then we started seeing basically uh, 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 these uh, 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 business elites and their associated political class uh, attempt uh, at thwarting any uh, basically evidence-based policy approach uh, to, to, to solving the financial crisis, which many uh, uh, um, uh, local and, uh, um, and internationally based Lebanese economists have tried to, uh, uh, to put forward and support uh, 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 the, the policy debate about it. So, so there was this, um, uh, uh, and the culmination of this was really when the um, Association of Banks, which represents the, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, interest of uh, owners of the banks uh, entered into collision with the government on the proposed government plan and, and, uh, and, and uh, even affected the past words and engagements that was strictly building with the IMF towards an exit from the crisis. So, uh, but I think the culmination of the policy inaction and incompetence uh, it came into play uh, more forcefully um, uh, uh, with the unfortunate uh, explosion of August 4, uh, um, uh, which, uh, uh, which basically uh, uh, um, uh, not only has, has shown um, an, an inability of, of the state uh, um, because of, of, uh, uh, of the, what, what the um, explosion unraveled in terms of corruption at the port and how it was managed uh, um, uh, and, 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 and the fact that uh, there has still no accountability on, uh, on this development, which also has economic implication because it's not allowing a lot of the institutions and particularly in the private sector and in uh, and, and, and households affected by the crisis to claim it from the insurance, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, sort of the premiums that 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 would allow them to uh, to to move ahead. But I think the culmination also was was that um, until now we have seen uh, um, an inability of Lebanon to build, but also I would say to squander uh, uh, um, uh, the opportunity uh, of uh, capitalizing on the international goodwill that the international community has shown after the blast uh, for providing both humanitarian assistance, but also maybe helping in devising a broader recovery plan, which I'm sure um, uh, uh, Mona uh, uh, will, will, will touch upon. But I think uh, this, this, this um, uh, combination of incompetence policy inaction, we have seen it over the last uh, uh, year quite forcefully and has, of course, very dangerous implication, I would say, because it has uh, deepen uh, the, the mistrust and uh, the lack of, uh, of trust uh, by the citizens in the ability of the state to take charge of them. And, and I think, um, as Rami said, uh, not only uh, um, um, uh, uh, what he quoted in terms of uh, uh, loss of face by, by the, the index he, he quoted, but I think also a very interesting new uh, survey done by Conrad Adenauer Stiftung across uh, uh, all transition countries or uh, what uh, uh, 10 years after the Arab Spring shows that Lebanon has one of the uh, lowest level of, of its citizens trust in both uh, government, parliament um, uh, 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 and political parties. 
so I think uh, uh, the, the fallout from this uh, um, uh, policy inaction, incompetence uh, throughout the management of the crisis, not, let alone, and I'm not going to go into that, how the COVID-related uh, uh, response to the COVID uh, uh, crisis uh, was managed, uh, just aggravated uh, these elements. Now, moving to my first, the second point quickly is, is, is that uh, the deterioration, so from that point, I see the deterioration in the socioeconomic uh, um, uh, situation, particularly since last October, a direct result of, uh, of these uh, uh, failure um, uh, of, of governance, but also um, uh, uh, um, of, of incompetence and policy inaction. And we have seen that by the inability to, um, uh, to, to move ahead with a comprehensive approach uh, to dealing with the debt and financial sector, uh, debt restructuring, financial sector collapse that really led to a severe contraction in, in GDP. I think you mentioned 9%, nine, 9% 9 but I think 2020, the latest numbers that we have is that the contraction of GDP in real terms can actually even more than 30%. So your GDP has gone from 50 billion to around uh, 18 uh, uh, billion. And if you uh, even, uh, uh, that is if you count, uh, adjust for the deterioration in the exchange rate, but, but that has serious implication on per capita income. And then of course, on, on, um, on the uh, um, uh, basically on the, um, uh, broader uh, uh, economic uh, uh, indicators, uh, particularly because this contraction in activity also led to uh, a, um, uh, uh, a quite a widespread shedding of labor across all the sector, which coupled with hyperinflation, uh, I mean, food, food, uh, food prices during 2020 uh, increased by 400%. Uh, 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 this is only food prices. Uh, we are at more than 130% uh, hyperinflation uh, today. Uh, the erosion of, um, of savings also in, in, in the banks through this process of socializing the losses, uh, as opposed to embracing a structured approach uh, with the help of the IMF and the international community, uh, uh, is de facto uh, basically resulting in a 70% haircut on, on people saving more than $120 billion of deposits in the, in the banks uh, that are uh, basically um, left uh, uh, many savings, uh, particularly of uh, 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 retirees uh, uh, in, in key sectors like in education and, and um, uh, uh, teachers, uh, 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 doctors, uh, uh, really reduced their, their savings uh, uh, to nothing. Um, but I think also uh, the migration flow, and as we talk about the trends, uh, um, the loss of skill and the exodus of talent is what is very dangerous uh, uh, today, particularly also the talent that is most needed during the COVID crisis, the talent of doctors and nurses, uh, but also professionals seeking opportunities uh, elsewhere. Um, uh, whether this will be a transient, a transient thing or not remains to be seen, and much will depend on where the outlook of the country will be. But, uh, but when we think that, that uh, the loss of human capital at a time where the country needs it the most uh, will, 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 will aggravate, I would say, the, the, uh, the, losses of the loss of capital that we are seeing uh, through the collapse of the banking se sector, then we are just uh, uh, adding um, uh, fuel uh, to, the, uh, to the fire. But I think um, uh, um, I, I don't only want to sound very negative, but I want to just maybe look at uh, the trends that I think in the short to medium term will continue to, to be with us on the economic front. I think, uh, um, um, uh, um, as I mentioned, I think uh, um, um, uh, we still see some uh, uh, some something to to hang on to and 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 build on for for a positive solution in the short to medium uh, medium term. And in my view, these are uh, uh, um, these are the following. The first one is the um, incredible amount of in, uh, social solidarity that I would maybe uh, call the informal safety nets that have uh, um, uh, that uh, that have left. 
uh, basically um, the, the country and society, I would say, uh, um, or the amount of destruction uh, uh, um, less severe than, than you could have seen uh, looking at the scale of the crisis and the losses. I think uh, um, uh, whether the flow of remittances that is still coming despite the um, uh, 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 the problems with the banking sector or uh, the solidarity uh, that we have seen uh, post uh, the Beirut explosions are important positives to build upon. And I'm sure uh, Mona will, 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 will touch upon that. But I think also um, uh, there is a, another side to this uh, solidarity, which has serious political implication, uh, which is the, the, the consolidation of informal networks of the existing political elites which constitute increasingly um, um, uh, uh, a way uh, for uh, um, uh, for lessening, I would say, the anger uh, um, and, and holding them accountable in the future uh, for, uh, for 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 uh, uh, the catastrophe that is befalling the economy uh, and the popularization of people. So we are seeing. A, an extreme uh, um, widening of uh, uh, distribution of uh, card um, of, of subsidized basically uh, debit card uh, that are related to uh, some political parties or uh, basic goods being distributed particularly during the winter and these informal safety net will have will leave their um, uh, um, uh, their uh, marks on, on how the political dynamics uh, will, will move uh, down the line. But the second uh, positive factor, I would say, is the private sector, uh, the Lebanese private sector, trying to seek opportunities out of, um, um, out, out of the collapse. I think uh, what we have seen is that with the um, sharp uh, deterioration in, and devaluation in the currency, even though in the, uh, in, uh, unofficially uh, in, in parallel markets, um, I think uh, uh, it gives opportunity for uh, some um, private sector to invest in industries that are either import substituting or has boosted some uh, um, uh, companies that have uh, export potential. It is still very small and very nascent, frankly, uh, compared to the to the broader crisis. But I think this is a green shoot that 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 is important to to build upon and uh, uh, and support. Um, and, but I think also the positive is this uh, increased demand for better governance of of, uh, of public policy. And I think. Uh, and particularly economic policy uh, in the future. I think the demand that we are seeing both from uh, the, uh, uh, some voices, I would say in the banking sector, there are only few of them and we hope they get uh, uh, um, uh, stronger and wider and wider in scope, uh, but but also in 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 uh, in a more engaged and uh, socially responsible private sector, uh, and of course through the forces of change uh, um, uh, of the um, uh, October 17 movement, there is a broad demand and agreement that uh, uh, a a new mode of economic governance uh, uh, need to be uh, um, instated. But I think the negative trends that we have to all work to, towards limiting is, as we said, the rapid popularization through a comprehensive approach to solving the crisis. Uh, 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 the negative other trend is the thriving cash economy uh, with uh, our porous borders, particularly with Syria, which is helping uh, uh, continue the hemorrhage of, uh, of uh, 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 little available dollar, dollar liquidity that Lebanon has across the border uh, because of the um, uh, mismanagement uh, of uh, subsidy rationalization, notably of that of the fuel, uh, 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 and, and the thriving uh, cash economy, which will be very difficult to reverse in the future. That's a negative trend that we are seeing. But also, um, I think uh, the, uh, uh, the broader isolation uh, of Lebanon from the global and regional sphere of development finance is for me uh, also a very uh, worrying trend. Notwithstanding the support that we have seen uh, or willingness of support from the international community and the international support group first uh, uh, before the uh, August 4 blast, but also after it, but um, in, in, in real terms, we have seen very little disbursements of the development finance to, to Lebanon over the past 
eight, uh, eight months, not more than 200, 300 million uh, in a time where Lebanon needs uh, 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 annually uh, uh, seven to eight billion dollars. So this isolation, which, ha which is also due to, 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 this, to the geopolitical uh, um, uh, uh, factors and the, uh, the domestic political stalemate, uh, has severe implication on cutting Lebanon uh, from, uh, from development finance. And finally, I mean, if we look in the future, I think it is extremely difficult for me to see how we can exit uh, without remembering that uh, after a year, uh, the Lebanese themselves, through this combination of incompetence and, 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 and state capture, have managed to um, aggravate the sizes of the losses. Uh, we started the last year with, uh, at the beginning of the year, with maybe a, a 50 billion uh, loss um, at, uh, or negative uh, equity position uh, at the central bank. Now it's probably bigger by at least 10 billion uh, in my uh, in my uh, We are also, uh, after a year, a much more prized um, um, uh, uh, landscape in terms of uh, uh, the policy, uh, economic policy choices because of our inability to agree um, on the uh, financial sector restructuring and the debt restructuring and on the distribution of these losses. We are in a weaker state because uh, of um, of the, our inability uh, to um, um, uh, develop a fiscal policy plan that addresses uh, 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 the public finances. Uh, so as we look into uh, the willingness of uh, the international community with the new U.S. administration, and we have seen President Macron willing to revive his French initiative, in my view, I see it difficult to move ahead uh, with this uh, initiative without reviewing at least uh, three issues. One, uh, the need for political reform to address these failures of, uh, of, of governance. Uh, second, um, uh, uh, insist as part of this initiative on uh, regaining state, uh, the capacity of state institutions to uh, develop and implement um, sound economic policies uh, 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 within a comprehensive framework. And three, last but not least, uh, establish constructive engagement with the international community and notably through an IMF program uh, uh, in order to mobilize uh, um, uh, development finance for a new growth uh, and finance model for Lebanon. Thank you, Alia, we appreciate it. Thanks very much. Uh, appreciate your, uh, your this is uh, truly another comprehensive look at a whole bunch of things. Uh, I hope that the question and answer period will be uh, also another opportunity to also uh, hash out some of these questions. Uh, Mona. Your turn. Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you're signing uh, in from. Thank you very much for this generous invitation uh, to the Arab Center. It's a pleasure really to be here. Um, um, uh, my talk is going to very much build on what Rami and Alia have said, and um, uh, it will be complementary to many of the ideas they raised. Uh, I want to mainly talk about three things. First is, um, and I won't be long with that because they've uh, shared with us a lot on the issues of inequalities and vulnerabilities. So I will go quickly uh, over that point. I want to focus on the absence of uh, social policy uh, at, the, at the national level that would uh, help Lebanese people go through those multiple crises there experiencing and living. And I want to uh, showcase uh, what this type of public policy making uh, does uh, on the ground by featuring the case of the management of the pandemic, uh, most, more specifically the territorial management of the pandemic. So speaking about this from, I would say, a spatial uh, perspective. And I will close with a note on, um, uh, a reflective note on oppositional politics. And, and the importance of organizing, I would say. So uh, as Rami and Dalia specifically demonstrated, uh, the governance system in Lebanon, the political and economic governance system in Lebanon is structured fundamentally, I would say, in unjust and unequal ways. 
And these, the system of governance have benefited it, a very small group of people and their networks at the expense of the majority. And that this in a, in a unequal system have manufactured uh, vulnerabilities that are deeply embedded in our social and spatial fabric and that are being aggravated. I use again the verb that Alia uh, highlighted because it's not that they've been born yesterday, but that they've been in the making for decades. And one could also go into history to find their, uh, their deep roots. So all these vulnerabilities are manufactured and are aggravated by the multiple crises we're living, including the, the recent August 4th blast. So uh, we have numbers on this inequality. The latest have been published by Lydia Aswad in uh, her study in 2018. And she shows how the income in Lebanon is extremely concentrated with the top one and 10% of the adult population receiving 25 and 55% of national income on the average. So this places Lebanon among the countries with the highest level of income inequality in the world. And that was even before the devaluation of the Lebanese pound and the collapses we're living that will certainly skew these uh, figures even further. Uh, these figures also reveal how uh, the dynamism of the economic sectors that were also always the, the flagship uh, sectors of Lebanon, banking, tourism, real estate have benefited only the minority of the population and the largest part of the population actually lives in extreme poverty and in poverty. So there's a recent report that was published by IFI building on Oxfam and the FI data that places these uh, that gives us a bit more of these figures and places the number of unemployed people in Lebanon. Uh, and it says that, that the, this number has doubled just over the past two years, and that today we have more than 20% of the for, for workforce that is unemployed, and an increasing number of people who are also worried about having enough food to eat. Uh, estimates from ESQUA say that 55% of the population is trapped in poverty and is struggling to meet bare necessities. And I won't say much more about this. I think it was covered largely. I just want to make sure that we understand vulnerability in its uh, multiple heterogeneities. So this is this involves uh, a variety of groups who are more vulnerable than others, including female-headed households. We have a lot of those in cities, migrants, refugees, tenants on old rent, even tenants on new rent now with the devaluation and people with disabilities among others. So facing all these uh, humongous challenges, uh, public policies addressing such challenges are, not to use a different qualifier, pretty much minimalist. And they do not address the root causes of these issues because they're made by the people who, pro who produce these inequalities and manufactures these vulnerabilities. I think Alia explained this very well. Um, I could I could have made a presentation on urban policies and taken the case study of the reconstruction after the blast to tell you how the reconstruction process and that reconstruction policy is mismanaged, how there's a small unit of the army piloting it, a flagrant absent of the municipality and other planning agents, a domination of UN bodies and international organizations and NGOs. But I was asked to focus on the social dimensions instead, uh, and I will use the works of my colleagues to do that, but I'll be very happy to uh, get back to issues related to urban policy and reconstruction, if any, there are any questions around that. So um, at the level of social protection and social policy, a study published in 2019 tells us that uh, merely 45% of Lebanese residents uh, actually, 45% uh, of Lebanese res residents do not have access to social protection. We have developed at the national level a national social protection system, mainly based on targeted cash transfers. And these are being given to a, a group of 43,000 households. Uh, and this program has been critiqued by a number of um, uh, 
policymakers and scholars because its eligibility criteria was unclear and the distribution packages that uh, occurred were unfair. And mostly it was critiqued because it's short-sighted given it does not address the root causes of this poverty and, and uh, inequality. So on the contrary, it contributes to create what Leah Bukhater calls a dynamic of exclusion, whereby the upper and middle classes are put relatively protected through a subsidized private sector that ensures this protection, whereas state employees are relatively provided for by the state, albeit in um, a limited uh, quality and quantity, and informal workers and self-employed and the unemployed are unprotected. So instead of privileging uh, the addressing the root causes of poverty and inequality that are linked to the dysfunctional and unproductive economic model we have been investing in and to develop efficient progressive taxation system and mechanisms, again, building on what Alia was saying, that would have financed a universal social protection scheme in Lebanon, we privilege short-sighted uh, policies that just kick the can like we do in, a, in an area, area of other uh, policy sectors. What, what this does really is uh, increase dependency on sectarian patrons, and it also facilitates the reproduction of this oligarchic political system. And um, in a recent uh, research project I've been developing in the Beirut Urban Lab, where uh, where I do this, uh, I do my research alongside Ahmad Garbiye and Mona Fawaz. We have been uh, studying the management of the pandemic by the Lebanese um, uh, government and variety of stakeholders. And we've um, seen how this management of the pandemic does exactly that, reproduce the sectarian system. So the pandemic as elsewhere, I mean, this has been an opportunity opportunity for authoritarian regimes and uh, even democratic systems all over the globe. It, the pandemic was very much used in Lebanon as an opportunity to strengthen uh, the grip of uh, sectarian actors, but also of the army and of the militarization process Rami man mentioned on the ground. So in our project, we documented the actions of sectarian political actors. Uh, as well as in other institutional actors, such as religious groups and international organizations. And we also documented the actions of civil society groups and grassroots uh, uh, and initiatives. So uh, we did that from the period of March till August 2020, just before this, the blast, actually the blast made us stop this project. And we documented around uh, 538 entries. Uh, and since the blast, we stopped working on this project because uh, the, the plight of the aggravated crisis we're living make us really feel that the pandemic is put in a relative uh, perspective. So uh, working on this data set, we've identified two broad categories of uh, actors' response, which we categorize as top-down actors and bottom-up actors. Top-down are the political and religious actors, government actors, international organizations, and the bottom up are more the NGOs, INGOs, collectives and campaigns, as well as university and professional actors. And uh, our main, uh, I would say, quantitative finding is that two thirds of the pandemic's response in, in Lebanon is dominated by sectarian political parties and religious groups and government actors, while one third of the response is distributed among a variety of other actors. So our work really highlights two sets of findings, and I'm going to sh share with you the maps that we've produced um, uh, uh, on that. So that's the first map that you get to see, which highlights the dominance of sectarian political groups, which are coded according to their uh, political um, logos and signs. So you see how over the whole national uh, territory, uh, sectarian, uh, sectarian um, actors have made sure to regain uh, their place in the territory through providing responses to the pandemic through a variety of actions actually that we, uh, we identified ranging from aid and relief to medical services, to quarantine centers, uh, to uh, even policing. Uh, and providing um, uh, 
pre or uh, in implementing preventive measures. Um, so the second map I'd like to show you is uh, one where we document both the top-down actors response and the bottom-up actor responses where you see the, the two-third, one-third proportion I mentioned earlier. And you see how the COVID-19 response in Lebanon reveals what we're calling contested territorialities uh, by actors who are less ideological than the dominant groups. So um, if, we, if we look at the data, we see that there are various modalities of governance, and these reproduce what we're calling multiple and contested territories that intersect together, coexist, uh, reconfigure dominant political geographies in some places, especially in cities. And uh, it shows that we do have a dominant uh, political order that is sectarian, but it, it is challenged by spaces of growing mutual aid and solidarity that were mentioned by my colleagues earlier. Uh, a third map, just for the pleasure of looking at nice maps that were developed by our visualization team under the direction of uh, Ahmad Garbiye is uh, this that shows us again uh, the variation of uh, uh, the responses across Qada and Muhafaza, where you see the hybridity of responses across Mount Lebanon, South Lebanon, North Beirut, etc. Uh, so this is an ongoing project which we hope to publish soon. So these are not yet public maps, but this is sort of a scoop presentation that gives you an idea about how the governance of this pandemic uh, informs us also on the, uh, about the situation uh, uh, we're living of a, of a particular, I would say, policy sector, health policy and, uh, and social policy in this relation. Now, uh, I want to focus in my last point on these spaces of solidarity, which are very much linked to spaces of op oppositional politics. So this is not new in Lebanon. We have been, okay, uh, electricity cut at 6 p.m. in Beirut. I think people who are uh, familiar with our electricity system, uh, that's an echo to our great infrastructure. Okay, uh, so continuing uh, my point i was talking about oppositional politics and the fact that people in lebanon have been protesting this the systemic inequalities and the uh, oppressive political system since decades and we can go back again to history to inform us about this but let's focus a little bit on what happened on october 2019 and the fact that these protests are still occurring just last week we had protests in um, we lost Alia too for electricity, so <laughs> she's going to sign in again. Uh, it's a 6 p.m. all across Beirut. So, um, so these protests will uh, continue, but uh, continued since October 2019, but they varied uh, enormously in, um, in their geographies and they became less intense, less frequent, more fragmented and dispersed, uh, although they didn't totally stop. Um, so, so th this growth of oppositional mobilization and oppositional politics have been consolid consolidating in, in uh, very strong ways, I would say, since 2009, and they have been coalescing, and I will highlight this verb, since at various points of time. So we saw that in 2015 with the garbage protest. Uh, the Youth Think movement. We saw this again in 2016 with the mobilization in the municipal elections and the Beirut Medinati experiment. We saw it again in 2018 with the mobilization to participate in national elections and the Tahail of Watani coalition up to October 2019, uh, where we saw a very different landscape of uprising that the people qualified as a revolution, where the decentralization of actions on the ground was noteworthy. All cities and towns were talking to each other and singing to each other their slogans. Uh, there was spatial appropriation of key sites, buildings, and infrastructures all around. The nature of the discontent change, that was the famous slogan of Kulloniani Kullon that encompassed all leaders and groups of the political 
spectrum as, and was quite uh, revolutionary. There was public defamation of uh, public actors and politicians uh, th that were afraid of going out in public without being defamed. The nature of the crowd was quite different and included a lot of women group, of feminist groups, of LGBTQ groups. They were very strongly linked to professional groups and syndicate movements started to re-emerge. Independent syndicate movements tried to, to, to reorganize. Uh, even people left the ranks of their sectarian parties to join the uprising. So we should not underestimate that moment because it is very much indicative of a, a profound change that Rami alluded to in his uh, in his talk that we need to to keep remembering because it 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 is continuing also also in um, in uh, less visible forms. So these opposition groups, I'm not romantic, romanticizing them at all. They have been also largely critiqued because they're not coordinated enough, they're not organized enough, they have an effective leadership because they privilege more horizontal forms of leadership over the traditional structures of political parties, they are dominated by a professional middle class, they're disconnected from grassroots, they have weak political visions and programs, all this has been well documented in various reports and writings. They are also operated by activists who are volunteers, so who volunteer their time and labor after hours, which is obviously unsustainable for the upkeep of such mobilization. There, are, there have been also, and I really want to highlight this point because we all, all, always critique these opposition groups for their internal problems, but we often forget to, to highlight the fact that they have been very violently repressed and suppressed by the state uh, by state militarization and by the army. Uh, and there has been a, a huge increase in the modes of control uh, against protesters. They've been injured seriously. There have been deaths. And uh, these have been also documented by Human Rights Watch reports very regularly. So we are in a conditions where organizing is extremely difficult to upkeep and to maintain. However, opposition platforms have been continuing to do so, and they have been trying to develop institutionally, programmatically, politically, and I can mention a few groups as examples of that, such as Muwatinun Muwatinat, Fidawla, the National Bloc, Lihaqi, and others. Professional unions have been also trying to mobilize along independent secondary lines, and maybe the most successful attempts to mobilize for of mobilization are found among students groups, secular students groups who have mobilized in the recent months and they won elections in private universities, which sent a, a very interesting signal on the ground. Also, the mobilization of a young uh, of young groups of diaspora is very remarkable, and their role in supporting the recovery works after the blast gathering millions of dollars and uh, adopting modalities of operation and distribution of these funds that are accountable and transparent also uh, is noteworthy uh, to think of among the multiple mobilization networks that uh, have been put in place over the past decade and are continuing to grow and strengthen and to solidify. So this really demonstrates an impressive capacity at organizing in Lebanon, uh, at working collaboratively, at imagining a more inclusive and just society and polity, one that puts people at the center of its work. So the journey for political change is of course very, very long, it's laborious, but we also need to see uh, that the building blocks are getting organized very slowly. There are a lot of ebbs and flows. There are a lot of mistakes and shortcomings, but even and even if this organizing seems almost inconsequential amidst the the really huge pains that we're living and that are created by the multiple crises the Lebanese are living, this organizing matters and it hasn't stopped. I will stop with on that note and thank you uh, for your attention and look forward to engaging more with you over Q and A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mona. We appreciate it. Um, uh, very nice. Um, I like it when you when you included all those uh, 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 groups that are uh, involved in uh, protests and in the, the grassroots uh, organizations that are uh, uh, hopefully, uh, in my opinion, they 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 present 
uh, Lebanon with a, a very nice alternative to what's going on today. Um, uh, we have uh, quite a few questions. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, basically in the order in which uh, you uh, uh, you spoke. So uh, we'll start with Rami. Uh, Rami, we have a question for you from uh, our Khalid Jashan. Uh, uh, he he is uh, he's, he's wondering: Does the hesitation by Arab states to come to Lebanon's rescue at this time stem from the same general lack of trust by the international community and the Lebanese elite and its mismanagement of the economic and political system, or are there un, uh, uniquely Arab concerns to justify this uh, regional hesitance? Uh, the answer to that is I don't really know, but it's a great question. Um, and you should create a study group to figure it out. Um, that's Khalil's job. But my, re my reaction to that is that, again, we've got to look at Lebanon in the broader Arab context. Something started in the 1980s in the Arab world uh, or the Arab region, um, which was the initial um, collapse of the integrity of the state of Somalia in the 1980s. And this has now spread to other countries. So we had countries that started to collapse internally. Uh, and then what happened was the international order, back then in the 80s, it was the Soviets and the American-led blocs, basically uh, gave up on these countries. They became disposable countries. And we've had now a series of disposable or disposable Arab countries. Uh, Libya was one, Yemen was one, Iraq in a strange way, even Syria in a strange way. Uh, they're not dispensable, but the international political order uh, dealt with them only in terms of the other country's self-interest. So the Turks would go into Syria because something was important for them. The Iranians, the Israelis, whatever. Um, these countries don't matter very much to the global strategic and security situation. Um, Lebanon particularly doesn't matter very much uh, because it's a very small uh, place, but um, the strategic issues in Lebanon, again, I think relate essentially to Hezbollah, uh, which means Iran and Syria, or the resistance front, as it's called. Um, so the, the when Arab countries are slow to come in to help Lebanon, I think it probably means Lebanon is not that important to them anymore. They have the, the, the strategic interests and the national development priorities, or in some cases, the national survival priorities of different Arab countries have radically changed today from what they were 30 or 40 or 50 uh, years ago. I remember Lebanon uh, in the 1960s when I was in college um, and the extraordinary uh, regional intervention, mostly through the media and political groups and stuff like that. Uh, that doesn't happen very much uh, uh, anymore. So that's, that's my, uh, gut, uh, my gut reaction, that the Arab countries have more important um, issues to deal with. If you look at the Emirates and the Saudis, uh, but particularly the Emirates, what they're trying to do in the Horn of Africa and North Africa, uh, getting involved in the war in Libya, setting up military and port bases. It's quite extraordinary. So Lebanon is really a peripheral uh, country now. Um, and we see it in the international community's reaction over the last year and a half or two years. The country keeps deteriorating. People suffer this terrible human suffering. Um, and the world says, we're ready to help you if you reform, but the political system in Lebanon doesn't want to reform. Therefore, the world says, well, you know, I'm sorry, we can't do anything. Um, and this is a terrible situation because uh, it does suggest that one option in the final uh, outcome is a Somalia option where the government collapses and you end up with tribal fiefdoms. The reason that's not likely to happen, though, is again, I get back to Hezbollah. Hezbollah cannot allow Lebanon to become Somalia, uh, nor does Hezbollah want to run Lebanon which it can take it over in theory, it's strong enough, but it doesn't want to do that for, for many different reasons. Um, and so, so the, the, the real future of a peaceful, equitable, um, dignified Lebanon needs resolving the conflict between Iran and the Arab countries in Israel and resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict. Both of those are doable, 
but they're not going to get done very soon. So I would imagine that we're going to live with the situation of uncertainty for, for quite a while. And Arab countries will come into Lebanon only when it gives them a direct uh, strategic interest in doing so. And those reasons are uh, very, very few now. Well, thanks, Rami, for this uh, very bright uh, and uh, <laughs> really happy uh, uh, answer. Um, no, I, 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 I understand. Uh, and it's, it's really um, a very difficult situation. And uh, you might be right that Lebanon may have, uh, may have lost its, uh, uh, its brightness, so to speak, um, for the Arab countries or for the international community. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Alia, I, I have uh, quite a few questions. Uh, uh, first of all, you you have uh, talked a lot about uh, basically. I mean, your your presentation was about the economic collapse and the economic problems, but still, there are uh, there is a question from uh, Jenny Silver who uh, basically asked what happened in 2005 uh, since 2005 that caused the downfall spiral into poverty. In other words, I mean, you know, this has become. Uh, this has been a gradual process. I mean, uh, well, what exactly happened to people? Uh, another question is, uh, I don't know if you are equipped to do this, but you probably are, uh, because you are equipped to do a whole bunch of things. Uh, uh, what is the imp uh, impact of uh, the, the, you know, the immigration of uh, skilled professionals uh, during the financial crisis? What's the impact of that on uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis and how to, uh, to manage that? Uh, so uh, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Imad. Um, no, absolutely. I think uh, mm, mm, uh, the problems of Lebanon are uh, are structural, and uh, and the uh, deterioration has been ongoing, um, at least both from the macro level, uh, uh, in a in a very flagrant manner. I would say uh, uh, since the 2000, uh, 2010, 2011. I think if you look at uh, uh, at periods where um, uh, 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 the the uh, popularization was was a, a bit limited, is because uh, this was due to um, uh, uh, to exactly uh, these these financing model uh, that allowed a lot of Lebanese to benefit uh, from very high interest rates in the banking system, uh, and. Um, uh, uh, in a very uh, obscure uh, obscure manner, uh, uh, and not understanding that uh, that the Ponzi scheme was uh, was building up, uh, and they were living on this sort of uh, um, uh, fallacy of uh, a bright and uh, and smart uh, financier running uh, running the show without really looking at the underlying uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, drivers uh, that were. Um, uh, 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 weakening over time, or whether through uh, an erosion of the potential of growth, because actually since the 2005, as you, as you uh, rightly said, uh, we have seen very little uh, growth in investment, uh, uh, at least productive investment or investment that, that was uh, job creating, but rather went into more sort of uh, um, a non-tradable uh, rent-seeking uh, 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 sector. Uh, but at the same time, uh, um, I think also uh, waves of migration, and that goes to the second uh, question, have, have reduced uh, the, uh, uh, the, the social impact of the crisis, uh, because let's, uh, let's remember that at least between 2005 2008, there was a, a lot of opportunities, at least before the financial crisis, for Lebanese to go uh, and, uh, and work in uh, abroad, whether in the region and globally, and keep basically sending remittances. And, uh, um, and it's really after 2010 that, that these remittances, because of the widening uh, 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 structural imbalances, uh, um, where we're becoming increasingly not enough and led to the buildup of that and, and the unraveling of the financial crisis. And, and as much as uh, the exodus of talent is, uh, um, uh, has been, or, the, uh, or relying on immigration on Lebanon has been uh, a way to dampen uh, the impact of a mismanaged economic policy since, since, uh, since the last two decades, 
through seven to eight billion dollar of remittances being sent. But I think today uh, um, uh, these exodus of talent has become increasingly a, uh, a liability. Uh, and and uh, and on the question of COVID, I think the numbers, we don't have accurate numbers, but some people say that in the thousand, we've lost uh, doctors and not nurses over the last uh, a few months. But I think what is more uh, critical is not only the, the human capital, but it's also putting a sector that was known to be um, uh, one of the most important exporter of services, at least in the region, uh, putting it under a severe strain because of this inability of, of managing the tension between keeping the economy going and then managing the, uh, in, uh, the necessity of having lockdowns to contain uh, the COVID. So, uh, so, so, so the, the, the emigration has added to this uh, inability uh, to manage. And maybe a last, last thing to say, uh, because there's a, a question related to that. I mean, when I say incompetence uh, in general, I'm not saying that people necessarily don't know, uh, are not qualified to do things. Uh, or, I mean, even people who have been put into positions over the last uh, year uh, are were successful in the private sector or in academia. But I think the business of dealing uh, with uh, a crisis, but also uh, public sector management, and managing uh, a state institution uh, uh, is not uh, something that you can learn um, uh, uh, as an afterthought or on, on the spot. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, to go back to the, to, the, um, uh, uh, to the subject of this session, which is sectarianism and, and poor governance, and that responds to one question on, on, this, on the Masraf Lubnan or on the Bank, Bank du Liban, uh, is that we have seen a, a, um, a systematic, basically, uh, uh, um, I would say push, push, uh, push, push back against the professionalization of the civil service in Lebanon. A civil service that is based on merit, on competence, and that has built its experience with from from the bottom of the public sector through uh, achievements and performance and uh, uh, delivery of services. Uh, and I think the fact that we shunned away from rewarding those who have been working in the civil service uh, along non-sectarian, non-clientelist uh, uh, um, uh, 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 parameters, but on, on the contrary, we have penalized them for, for not adhering uh, to these um, uh, clientelist networks have uh, uh, undermined uh, the ability of the, of, of the state uh, to deliver the services, uh, particularly in the social sector, but also have reduced considerably uh, uh, the uh, framework for and the quality of policy for relation, execution, and evaluation within the public sector. And what we are seeing today is just a direct result of that. Uh, thank you very much. I, I must apologize. That question about the COVID, the uh, exodus of professionals uh, was from uh, Elizabeth Oida. Uh, uh, now, a question from me to Mona, and uh, you actually uh, tried to bait everybody, and I, you baited me. Uh, please tell us about the reconstruction after the reconstruction process that you alluded to after the uh, August 4th uh, explosion at Beirut port. Yes, so um, uh, the reconstruction process is currently um, mismanaged and miscoordinated. Uh, it's mainly led by, um, it wants to be led actually, it's trying to be led by uh, army unit, the forward emergency room that's located, uh, that took office in the municipality of Beirut and that is trying to coordinate the response action of NGOs on the ground. So they have defined a perimeter of action in conjunction with uh, OCHA, the um, organization that uh, coordinates the work of the UN agencies, UNDP, UNHCR, and uh, UN Habitat, among others. And uh, they have distributed certain uh, uh, sectors 
to NGOs trying to coordinate the action and to reduce duplication and all overlaps and enhance uh, coordination among uh, all these actors. So they've created this dashboard where, and they've created this system through which NGOs should come and register and uh, commit to um, repairing a number of units uh, that are of a certain level of destruction. So they're only repairing the units that can be repaired. Uh, so what we call level one and level two, the most uh, hurt by the uh, explosion, level three uh, that have structural damage uh, have been um, have been earmarked for interventions that are more costly and they are still uh, standing uh, as they are under very uh, poor structural uh, conditions in uh, the, the neighborhoods uh, affected by the blast. Uh, so on the ground, what we have is people, residents, businesses who don't know about the process of repair because this process of repair was not uh, uh, that was not well conceived and well communicated to them. So depending on their networks and who they know and friends of friends or friends or, or of their children, they would be able to access certain NGOs to be able to know how to to get support and repair their. Uh, their homes or their businesses. And there is a majority of people people who are left out from the process, which is extremely slow. And uh, a lot of people have had to resort to their own means to repair. So those with means are better off than those without means. Those who man uh, manage to uh, fill uh, uh, the, the um, survey that was distributed by the army to provide compensation received some uh, funds in Lebanese pounds. Uh, some people received much more funds than others. So on the ground, it's a very messy situation uh, where you have a, a very high heterogeneity of situations. There's no vision guiding the response. There's no strategic plan guiding the response. Uh, the, the blast has not been used as a, as a potential opportunity to rethink uh, urban policy and planning in, in this, these parts of Beirut that have been gentrified over the past years, where a, a lot of people have been evicted as well, and where there's a real danger of population displacement and of uh, ending up with ghost neighborhoods where very few people live because it's not livable anymore. Uh, so I'll stop at that. Okay, thanks very much. Um, uh, this is a, uh, a question from uh, to Rami from uh, uh, Marcus Montgomery, uh, who basically asks, uh, uh, you noted the widespread political influence of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, what would uh, you say to those in Washington uh, who demand Lebanon root out Hezbollah if Beirut wants financial and other support from the United States and the international uh, funding institutions? Well, if we lived in a, in a world where consistency and morality actually mattered, we would tell the United States government, you negotiated with the Taliban, you negotiated with the Viet Cong, people who were killing you, you can sit and talk to Hezbollah, they're not directly killing Americans. Uh, but of course, we don't live in a normal world. We live in a world of political hypocrisy and double standards, which are universal, to be fair, not just the, not just the American government. Uh, but the American government has taken this attitude, um, and it's not just Trump, it's, this goes back for years, where uh, essentially they view the world as um, uh, markets or targets. Uh, it's either a market that you exploit commercially, or they're targets that you bomb and sanction and threaten. And the most common expression on the lexicon of American politics in the Middle East is probably nothing is off the table. In other words, military force sanctions, whatever. Um, the, the United States attitude to Hezbollah is essentially driven by Israeli and pro-Israeli forces in Washington. And uh, this has been the situation uh, for many, many years. The advent of the Biden administration uh, remains to be seen, but the tradition of centrist Democrats like Biden and Blinken and others uh, is not very encouraging for people in the Arab countries uh, because the uh, tradition of the centrist Democrats, which they've shown towards Hezbollah and other uh, issues, Palestine issue particularly, um, is that the Israelis have more rights than Arabs, that military force is the main um, 
instrument of diplomacy and that Arab ordinary people uh, have no rights, not just in Lebanon or Palestine, but across the region. And of course, this goes back to 1920. Again, we've got it, the century perspective is critical. If you go back and look at the Balfour Declaration and the League of, Ma League of Nations mandates, um, the, they, the Arab people don't exist. They're invisible people. Um, they're actors, they're like cartoon figures, uh, but they don't exist as people with rights. And it's been that way for a century. Trump's administration brought this to an extreme uh, level uh, of cruelty um, with what they were doing in Palestine and, and other places. Uh, but the issue of Hezbollah uh, is an issue that reflects the collapse of the Lebanese state, the inability of the Lebanese state historically to take care of its people, which was one reason why Hezbollah was born in terms of internal social equity and in terms of Israeli occupation and harassment of the south of Lebanon. So Hezbollah came up in the early 1980s uh, before the 19, early 1980s, there was no Hezbollah. Um, so these are movements that, uh, Hamas is similar. These are movements that play multiple roles. Uh, one of them is military resistance to Zionist threats and Western imperialism, as they call it. Uh, one of them is social equity within uh, their countries. Uh, and one of them is just simply trying to live a normal life and not be attacked and threatened and sanctioned uh, by uh, foreign powers, whether in the region or internationally. There's, just, there's many, many dimensions to a group like Hezbollah. Some of them may be good, some of them are not good. Um, but the answer to a group like Hezbollah is they have legitimacy in their country, not with all Lebanese, but with many Lebanese. And they have legitimacy among many people in the region. You can't ignore them. So if you can't ignore the Taliban and you can't ignore the Viet Cong, um, by all means, you shouldn't ignore Hezbollah and just try to threaten it uh, and, and sanction it, but try to engage politically uh, in a manner that ultimately leads you back to the core reasons why Hezbollah was born. And these are tough issues, as we've heard uh, today. These are not issues that are going to be resolved soon. Social equity, social justice, economic opportunity, inequality, pa pauperization, social protection, uh, these are, uh, and just voice, and e even now when Lebanese try to, and, and not just Lebanese, again, I go back to my first point, all over the region, Iraq, Sudan, Lebanon, and Algeria, and Jordan sometimes, and some other places occasionally, when people go out into the streets, they increasingly are met with a militarized battalion. It's quite extraordinary. Um, and um, this is a common uh, problem. So even the voice of people to speak out, is uh, increasingly difficult for many Arab uh, citizens, and we see it in Lebanon with the with the protests. Uh, the answer: these are political issues that have social and economic roots, uh, and they can only be ultimately addressed by going and and tackling those issues in a political process, which is not easy to do uh, right now in Lebanon. The political elite doesn't want to do political reform; doesn't want to engage. In a, in a dialogue. The political elite gave a few concessions at the beginning of the uprising in October. And, I, and again, exactly the same thing happened in Algeria, Sudan, and Iraq. When the protests happened, the people at the top made immediate concessions. We'll have a new election law, we'll have a new election, a new president. We're going to put some people in jail, get some people, corrupt people on trial. Uh, limited concessions, change the voting age, but no real change in how power is exercised. And that's that's the that's the, the real issue. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, th uh, thanks, Rami. Appreciate it, uh, Ali. I wanted to ask you about the 250 million that uh, I think it was the World Bank, was it, that uh, allocated to Lebanon uh, a couple of weeks ago, two three weeks ago, for uh, COVID relief. Uh, are those? I mean, uh, we we're short on time, but are those really uh, used? Those funds used uh, wisely? Uh, well, I think there are two things. There's the uh, 246 million for the uh, uh, um, uh, the support, the, the the cash transfer program uh, that that uh, that is that the World Bank is helping uh, address the uh, mitigate the impact of the crisis on uh, on the most vulnerable groups. Uh, that uh, 
And then we have the uh, COVID-related uh, uh, support that I think is jointly, if I'm not mistaken, by the World Bank uh, with, the, with the WHO. Um, I think expanding the safety net and putting it in place is extremely important. Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, concern that uh, uh, at least part of this uh, foreign uh, uh, funding that is coming also, also, of course, in the form of loan uh, is being uh, channeled to recipient in uh, Lebanese pounds and not at the market rate. So, uh, so de facto, uh, 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 there's more or less a haircut, but of course, it's benefiting uh, the, uh, the coffers of the, of the Central Bank of Lebanon. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, contentious issues when it comes to implementation, but I think in the grand scheme of things, given the short-term need uh, to, to have uh, um, uh, uh, resources to, to, um, um, uh, to support uh, vulnerable groups is extremely important. I think the other concern that was uh, that relates to the sectarianism and the governance is the ability of managing this in a transparent and, uh, and based on uh, uh, solid criteria. I think there is a, a tremendous effort that has been made by uh, the Central Inspection and other uh, uh, institutions and a program called impact that is trying to improve the the, the targeting uh, of, of the program working with the world bank and other stakeholders so there are efforts that are aiming to uh, um, uh, uh, contain basically uh, the uh, uh, the eagerness of the politician to capture i would say part of uh, <laughs> of these uh, uh, of this financing i hope we will be able to uh, uh, to reduce their their footprints on uh, and maximize the impact on those that needed the most uh, thanks alia uh, one final question to uh, to Mara. this is an uh, email question from bill grant uh, when will this situation become dire enough for people from all sections or, or sects to decide that the collective good is more important than their own sex prosperity? This is uh, not about the people. It's about uh, people in state institutions. We want people in state institutions to, to be custodians of the common good and to uh, to hold people accountable when they don't respect the, the common good. So it's not, uh, I think uh, the solidarity initiatives we have show that uh, people are aware of the value of collaboration and working together and people who are trapped in the clientelistic system of sectarian pat patrons are not uh, happily trapped. They don't have much choices. They have been socialized into the system for a variety of uh, conditions. We're not culturally bound to be sectarian or to be trapped in clientelism. We suffer from a state that has been captured, to go back to the key term that Talia used. Uh, we suffer from uh, political actors that have extracted public resources of the state and natural resources of the country. And as long as these people are in charge of state institutions, we don't have anybody who's protecting that public good. The public good by definition ought to be uh, protected and safeguarded by public servants. We do not have public servants or very few to be, to be fair. Very few are struggling in, um, in some public institutions. So um, yeah, just well, to very few and we we want them to be very many um uh, thank you very much for that answer appreciate it uh thanks for the panelists uh for um, uh, for being with us today this is this has been really illuminating we appreciate your participation uh thanks to the uh to our audience for uh, participating and sending in their questions we appreciate it again and again and uh, thank you very very much have a very good day